Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Next Economy Movement Series. I'm Ryan Honeyman from Lift Economy, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Momaka Agbo. Um, Momaka, thanks for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, so welcome to everyone. Uh, this session is uh, our seventh session in the Next Economy Movement Series. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you who are just joining, um, I'm going to give a really brief housekeeping of like how Crowdcast works and then um, also a brief introduction to today. So, um, uh, again, Amaka is here. She's going to give a more um, in depth uh, overview of, of her work. But just briefly, um, Amaka has deep experience in organizing electoral campaigns, policy, and advocacy on racial, racial social, and environmental justice issues. Um, and among other things, she supports projects that build uh, resilient, healthy, and self-determined communities rooted in shared prosperity. So uh, folks can trickle in a little bit as we're uh, as the conversation progresses, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So housekeeping, um, you should submit your question. There's a little ask the question button at the bottom. Uh, and the chat is more for conversation, um, but if it's a sort of substantive question, go ahead and put it in the ask a question area. That way that we can track it and make sure it doesn't get lost in the chat. Uh, and you can also upvote and downvote questions there as well. So it's a good, uh, good way to see which questions are getting the most uh, traction. Um, one thing we do that's, I think, important and fun in these is we ask folks to join on screen if they're available. So if you're open to it, we may ask you to join on screen and join us in the conversation because it creates sort of more fun dynamics. Um, and we love to hear from you. We like to, this to be a two-way conversation as opposed to one way. Um, we're also live streaming on Facebook. So if you're joining there, there should be a link to the Crowdcast. Uh, and this event's being recorded. So if you want to check out um, all of the past episodes, you can either check them out here on Crowdcast or visit the Lift Economy YouTube channel. So with that, I wanted to pass it to my friend Amaka um, to give you know, more, more uh, substantive introduction to who you are and your work, and then a little bit of, of you know, uh, orientation to your work as well. Sure, sure. Thanks, Ryan, for having me. Thanks to the Lift Economy team for welcoming me back to talk a little bit about my work and what I've been up to. I think we kind of recorded that podcast together two, three years ago now. Um, so a lot has happened um, since then. And I think a lot has happened both in the field of work around regenerative economy and, um, and social movement work, but then also just on the national and global social, political and economic landscape. Um, by way of introduction, we'd love to let folks know, um, yes, I go by Nwamaka Echo. I use the pronoun she, her, and hers. I'm based out of um, Oakland, California, um, unceded Ohlone territory. Um, and I have the pleasure of wearing a number of different hats. Um, so like Ryan mentioned, um, I really come from a long-term social racial justice organizing background. Um, and over the years, most recently have spent time kind of developing a consulting practice based on a framework that I created called restorative economics, which I'll kind of unpack um, for you all in a moment. Um, but I would say that my consulting practice has both been um, an element of providing project management support, technical assistance, and strategic advice to community-owned and governed projects. And um, as a way of trying to support those projects and really figuring out their business modeling, um, what their long-term development strategy and plan is, Capital continues to be a critical resource that all the projects need to really get off the ground and go to the next level. So that's kind of led me into the second half of my consulting practice where um, I'm providing more and more support um, to donors and impact investors and foundations that are really trying to think through how to activate and move all their resources in a mission aligned way. And so that's kind of a, a quick summary of, of, of who I am and what I'm up to. But um wanted to take a moment to share with you all just a bit more about um, restorative economics and particularly my worldview um, into, into this work. And um, one of the things I'll start off by saying, and some of you may have heard me share this in past stories, um, when I decided to go back to graduate school um, in 2012, 
Um, one of the the very um, opening paragraph in my economics course book was um, was a description of what economic the study of economics was, and um, this description described the study of economics as the person who gets to decide who eats caviar and who eats potatoes, the person in the process for deciding who's taking the public transit and who's driving a, a Corvette. And so I lift that up to just say that that is the worldview under which we enter a conversation of economics. We enter a conversation of capital and resources. And all that to say that um, we all get to hold a different worldview. We get to hold a worldview where it's not a, a decision between who gets to have caviar and who eats potatoes, but it's actually one of which the central question being how do we ensure that all people have access to safe and healthy food? And so just want to um offer up that my work um, at Restorative Economics is really about going into every conversation and asking why in the hopes of unpacking kind of the social, political, and historical context of how these structures and institutions came to be so that we can actually make informed choices and decisions for how we move capital and resources in a way that's deeply rooted in our values of justice, liberation, and equity. And so all that to say, um, one of the reasons you know, I decided to build out the restorative economics framework um, was was for a couple of reasons. Um, the first being um, that, you know, as I was kind of watching the new economy movement, um, the just transition movement um, emerge in the global north, um, for me, somebody that comes out of a racial justice organizing background, for me as a black woman, um, I was always looking for the places in which there was a race analysis that was actually um, integrated into those conversations. And so, um, unfortunately, didn't actually see a lot of the, the race and class analysis that social movements have been working on for decades embedded within those frameworks and those tools. And so for me, restorative economics is an opportunity to be very intentional about who we are moving resources to, why we are moving resources to them, and how we then move those resources. And so to just be quite explicit, I think when we look at the history of the United States, it's, we can unfortunately look at examples of the genocide and stolen lands of indigenous people, the enslavement of Africans, um, particularly in the South, um, the, the exclusion of immigrant workers from being able to participate in the benefits of all of our economy has to offer. And so restorative economics is really, quite frankly, rooted in um, a commitment to reparations, recognizing that we need to actually reinvest resources back into those communities that have been disproportionately impacted. And we need to actually do it in a way that it creates an opportunity for restoring those communities, making them whole, create an opportunity to actually heal our economic system so that we all then get to engage in a conversation on what does reconciliation look like going forward and reconciliation being how do we actually create an economic structure that values all life, right? That's actually rooted in a worldview where we all get to live with dignity um, and freedom and justice. And so the work that I do is um, I start off by really um, first looking at supporting projects that are community owned and stewarded. Um, rather than advancing kind of the wealth accumulation of individual um, wealth holders um, and or of corporations, I'm really interested in what are the creative ways that projects are coming together to be collectively owned together in community. And so I think we have a very robust cooperative movement um, in, in the United States and uh, the global north. We can also look at creative models like joint limited liability partnerships and, and other ways that people are starting to figure out how to ensure that it's not just one individual um, that is siphoning off all the profits, but as a community, we're coming together and all kind of benefiting in the collective um, ownership of this particular asset. And this is a, as part of a strategy to help us move out of an economic system that's very much uh, propped up by supporting um, a model of individual riches and towards something that's more frankly rooted in shared prosperity. And that the other piece of the work um, is to not just have more people owning more things together, but that these people are coming together in community and making decisions together about how to use um, and take care of and manage that asset. And so um, when we tend to think of governance, unfortunately, 
Um, I think that we have been trained to think of governance as something where we go out and vote every four years in the elections. And yes, I will hope that everybody turns out to vote um, this November. Um, and what I want to lift up is that voting is only one element of our civic engagement duty and responsibility, that the opportunity to support community owned and governed projects allows us to show up as active daily stewards of our communities, where we're coming together and actually sitting with the hard choices and rough questions of how to make decisions that are better off for the community as a whole, rather than only kind of prioritizing the benefits, the wealth, the resources for an individual or for a single corporation. And that at the end of the day, while I think it is um, once again amazing for these um, community assets to be held um, together um, in community, that the work is about as much of advancing the economic power of low income, disproportionately impacted low income communities of color as it is leveraging those assets to then advance the political, cultural, and economic power of these particular communities. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I have a, a few more slides, but I think what I really wanted to lift up for folks is kind of the worldview and how I enter the conversation and, and if it makes sense to kind of unpack some of the other elements that are embedded um, within how I think about restorative economics, particularly as it shapes our due diligence process um, with our work on the Restorative Economies Fund and my work with the Catali Foundation, happy to do so, but um, don't want to talk at you guys the whole time. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, you know, one of the questions, uh, in the Q&A section, what are your favorite examples of community-owned and stewarded organizations or efforts? Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. Um, so I think one of uh, a project that I had the pleasure of supporting, um, and now I serve on the board of, um, is a project called the Buen Vivir Fund. The Buen Vivir Fund is, uh, is a community-governed fund um, hosted by or managed by Thousand Currents. Thousand Currents is a philanthropic organization that does grant making in the global south. And the Buen Vivir Fund was a body of work. Um, that Thousand Currents grant partners came together and said, you know, we actually want to co-create, co-design um, and structure a fund where we can not just move grant dollars, but also move investments into a lot of the solidarity economy projects that these indigenous communities, black and brown communities in the global south are taking on. And so I think that process of going through how to build trust, that process of really starting to question um, why we have market rate returns and can we actually look at something differently? Can we, rather than having collateral where in the event people take out a, a loan for their business, they have to put up their home or their car, could we actually look at the trust um, that exists um, within members of the Bon Vivir Fund? Um, and then coming together um, to support one another around the technical needs of their projects. And so I think the Bon Vivir Fund is a super exciting project um, I think, you know, we're fortunate enough to have the Federation of Worker on Cooperatives being, um, I think, still led by Melissa Hoover. And that um, is just a robust network of worker on cooperatives um, across the country. So, the, you know, one of the things that um, I really try to remind people of is that there's no shortage of examples for what this work can look like um, on the ground. Um, I think our willingness to actually give them the, the credit um, and the platform that they need to really amplify their their models and and talk about why it's working um, is really exciting and and happy to kind of sprinkle in some other projects throughout our, our conversation as well. Yeah, strong plus one for Buen Bavir Fund. Um, so you know, the meanings of this conversation is around movement building. I'm curious, how do you see your work in restorative economics, um, non-extractive finance, when you think of like the intersection between movement building, you know, what comes up for you? Like, where do you see the sort of the paths overlap for for you? Yeah. He's a fund, um, and I should offer up the, the sort of economies fund is a new integrated capital fund um, where we move um, non-extractive finance and provide uh, technical assistance support to our grantee of projects across four different community wealth building areas. Um, all that what was the name say, of that about again, Amaka? All right, the, the Restorative that. Economies Fund, our mm -hmm. website doesn't Thanks. go up um, until next week. The Restorative okay. Economies Fund is a program area of the Katali Foundation, K A. 
T A L Y. Um, we also, all the websites won't be up until next week. We're pretty new. Um, but all that to say, it's based off of the restorative economics framework, clearly. And so, um, one of the things um, that we really lift up when we go to kind of engage your project um, is that we ask them, how are you rooted in community? How are you connected to supporting and being a part of the local social movement um, in um, in the place where you live, the place where you operate? And I think that this is important because oftentimes I, our conversations do stop at the economics of it, the economics being um, just the financials of the of the performance of a particular community owned enterprise and um, and I think our role and responsibility once again it's not just see ourselves as businesses operating um, in a particular community but as um, businesses that have the ability to then um, engage um, political power and cultural power and how we also support the rest of our community members neighbors families and friends and thriving as well and so I'm always interested to see um, how is a particular, um, like in the case of Restore Oakland, um, Restore Oakland being a community owned um, and governed project by the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and Restaurant Opportunity Centers United, both organizations are movement membership based building organizations. So they come out of a long history um, of grassroots organizing and um, in their effort to kind of create this community center space. Um, the process for the design um, of this space um, and working with architects like Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, engaged um, a community um, and young people. Um, and the space itself is designed to support social movements. So as many of us are sheltering in place and working um, online, um, the ability to actually have a dedicated space where organizations can come together and bring their members to kind of support um, their movement organizing work. So always looking for how people see themselves as connected to a bigger part um, of their community than just kind of the economics of what they're financially bringing in. And, um, and while we work to not be prescriptive, we do really work to kind of politicize the projects that we support and really um, wanting to be um, deeply engaged in social movements. The last thing I'll say on this piece about why it's important is that it's the frontline social movements and organizers that actually make it possible for us to even have these conversations, right? So when people are actually quite literally putting their lives on the line, like in the case um, um, of the fight for the North Dakota Access Pipeline, that conversation around water being um, sacred, around water being a human right, then allows the rest of us to have a conversation around water restoration practices and how we think about managing our water supply. And so the ability to always really lift up and recognize the ways that it's those communities that are on the front lines um, that are pushing back against the powers that seek to hurt and harm us that actually make it possible for us to engage in another conversation where some of us can then kind of talk about, well, what are the new models that we want to lift up from that? And so um, that's why I'm always looking to see how our projects are in direct relationships with work like Movement for Black Lives, like the North Dakota Access Pipeline and so many um, other social movements taking place across the country. Thank you for that. You know, one other thing that uh, came up before we started as well is this idea of um i guess incrementalism and the you know the constant uh you know for those of us who are sort of uh want radical change now as opposed to what maybe folks who hold power or maybe larger communities think is possible how do you how do you how do you reconcile or how are you holding this idea of like the Biden I guess Biden example like yes let's elect Joe Biden but um, is that enough or sort of like how do you reconcile the like radical piece so I'm curious how how are you holding that idea of moving quickly and then not letting the the incremental slow us down from that larger mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's a really good question, Ryan. And I would say, you know, for me, I come out of a background, once again, of having worked on policy, of having worked on electoral strategy, um, and some would regard those as incremental um, approaches to change. Um, and while I, I think those strategies are still important because they help to move the needle on the very real impacts that people are experiencing in the present moment. And so as social movements, as those of us that are committed to radically transforming systems, 
um, the ability to hold both the incremental or hold both the transformative strategies together needs to happen because otherwise we actually end up undermining each other as a social movement. And I think the other thing is that sometimes we fail to understand how the incremental pieces actually add up to the transformative uh, uh, strategies as well. So one of the things that I would lift up is, you know, as we kind of look for this national call to defund the police, and we've seen what has been made possible now in Minnesota, but we also see what's been made possible in the Bay Area, um, is that Jackie Byers, the executive director of Black Organizing Project, always reminds us that the call to defund the police didn't just start in May of 2020. Black Organizing Project has been doing this work on the ground in Oakland for over 10 years, right? Really challenging and, and pushing back around having police officers in our public schools, really organizing parents to get them involved with the Oakland Unified School District. So some could look at what BAPA is doing as the incremental strategy, the incremental organizing strategy that led us to this transformative moment, right? And then once again, it's all about our perspective. Um, and so for BAPA, they've been doing the work. They, you know, some may call it transformative, but they've, they've been laying the bricks for this to happen. And so the ability to hold places for all the strategies so that we're not undermining each other, but that we're clear about how each strategy is um, is amounting um, to the work of of a collective movement. I think another example I, I would sit with that I'm um, just so thrilled by, um, uh, when I worked at the L. Baker Center for Human Rights, um, I had the pleasure of working alongside the Books Not Bars campaign um, led by people like Zach Norris, who's now the executive director of Ella Baker Center, Jennifer Kim, who's now the California State's public safety consultant, um, Samaya Wahid, who's now up in um, Seattle, all that to say, at the time, Books Not Bars was passing policies um, to do a family connection bill to ensure that incarcerated um, young people would be able to um, be able to call their family members um, on the phone. They worked to pass policies to end solitary confinement of young people. And that was work that the Ella Baker Center um, and those individuals have been leading over the past some decade. And now the work of Jennifer Kim in her role as the California State Public Safety Consultant, being able to push for the closure of the Department of Juvenile Justice. So once again, I think there's just so many examples that we have to understand um, why the incremental is important and th therefore why we also need to continue to support the long-term organizing strategy because it's that organizing strategy work as well that is the foundation for any of the transformative leaps um, any of us are trying to make. That's so helpful, especially that framing around holding both the incremental and the radical so they're not undermining each other. That really resonated. Um, and especially this idea of um, I think somebody was saying recently, you can't remember who, but you have all these, like you're planting all these seeds for the time when it, it can happen. Like you said about, you know, 10 years of pre-work before defund the police or, or the May, you know, for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, that organizing of 10 years makes it possible to have that shift. Um, and I think, you know, with the LIFT team, we've often talked about the Black Lives Matter policy platform, you know, that's like very specific policy things that have been around. And then when suddenly the time is right, you have folks have access to like, okay, here's, it's not like everyone's scrambling to like, okay, what should we do? It's like, this is, this work has been done. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, let's see, I'm, you know, you spoke to, what is most energizing you right now? Like what's getting you most juiced about life? Or, or what, what's, what's, um, you know, what possibilities are you most excited about? Yeah, um, I will be honest. That's a hard question to access in this moment as we sit in California with heat waves and fires and many earthquake tremors. Um, that being said, though, um, I think the the stuff that excites me um, most right now. Um, you know, there's a moment I used to think of myself as one of those young people um, out in the streets. Um, um, but I will say the young people out in the streets that continue to show up um, and make these these calls and these demands in an unapologetic, unafraid way. Um, when I think about um, the young people continuing um, to be on the streets in Rochester, to be on the streets in Kentucky, to continue to fight and to be able to hold this piece of 
On one hand, the, I think the pushback that I've heard around this particular um, social moment is that people are like, well, we don't know what comes after we defund the police, therefore we're not going to do it. And um, which I, you know, I kind of reject that statement. Um, I don't think that's helpful or that um, really speaks to the level of harm um, that Black communities have experienced. But that being said, to see young people that are be able to kind of hold this duality of, on one hand, yes, we do have we do have a sense of what we're calling for. We have a sense of the need for investment in more mental health support services, the need for investment in quality housing, all the things that um, that give people access to a good quality of life. And at the same time, we don't fully know how to implement it just yet. So the ability to like have a sense of what we're moving towards, even if it's not fully formed, I think is um, is deeply inspiring to me. Um, and particularly one of the things that's coming out of COVID um, that I that I've really appreciated is. In the global south, um, we have a history and an experience of mutual aid networks, right? There's a way that um, black and brown and indigenous communities self-organize and support themselves um, out of necessity. And so what, what I saw emerge earlier this spring is mutual aid networks and organizing kind of proliferating um, across the country, particularly in places where there's a robust social movement. And so what is exciting for me is to see how those networks, those efforts where we have the mass, the Massachusetts Redistribution Fund in Oakland, we have um, the work of uh, the East Oakland Collective in partnership with the Black um, Cultural Zone. All these things have been self-organized to make sure people had access to food and hand sanitation and all the things that they needed to keep themselves healthy. And people also starting to look at, oh, those networks that we created, those relationships that we celebrated and honored, those are actually things that we want to formalize. And that way of being in community and sharing and supporting one another are part of some of the inklings of what this more just economy can begin to look like. And so the ability to think about how to formalize what have been regarded as like informal networks and informal funds and actually lean into the values and visions for what they were created to then inform. How can we continue to use this mechanism um, as a way to continue to redistribute resources um, to communities? I think that's really exciting for me because now people have gotten a taste of what it could look like and there's a vehicle for how to make it happen. And the question is the, the ability to to formalize it, to lean into it, and to make it more robust. Yeah. Great. I'm going to bring Andrew back up. Hey, Andrew. <laughs> no, maybe um, you want to ask a question, Andrew? Or Sure, and yeah, I wanna just remind everyone who's tuning in, um, if you have questions that are coming up, definitely don't hesitate um, to ask a question in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess, so I just, uh, last week and this week, I'm releasing this uh, kind of in-depth bi biographical interview series with Clark Arrington. And uh, the one that was just released is really kind of focused in on land in the mix of this. And one of the things that he kind of mentions is like in a context of possible impending civil war, like <laughs> people really like stacking up uh, weaponry and whatnot and, and organizing militias like in the context of movement building and supporting movement infrastructure, like. I guess that's just something that's top of mind for me right now. So maybe if I don't, I don't know if you feel inspired to speak on that. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can riff off of that, Andrew. Um, yeah, and Clark um, is amazing. Clark's work with the working world and Seed Commons and so many other projects. Um, I also have the pleasure of working with Clark um, on the Black Land and Power Project, which is um, a project of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Um, so all that to say, I think what is becoming clear um, is that the way our economy is designed is to tell people that you need to go out and make a wage so that you can therefore pay for all the things that you need, right? Your housing, your food, transportation. Um, and what people are becoming clear as we start to continue to peel back the layers of how our economy has functioned and been designed to oppress us is the ability to understand that there's other critical resources that also allow us to be able to provide um, uh, 
access to dignified livelihoods for ourselves. And one of those things being land. Um, and so I'm deeply moved by the work of um, Black Land and Power and kind of looking at how do we retain land that is in Black ownership in urban, suburban, and rural spaces? How do we maintain that land? And then how do we grow it with the understanding that when communities are able to have access to sacred and safe spaces, then they're able to provide the education, they're able to feed each other, support one another. And so I think that that element of self-determination is exciting to see social movements really, um, really kind of embedding within their work. Um, and I would also say that this is the same work that, you know, the Black Panthers were, were looking up for us in the 60s and 70s. Um, this is the one of the reasons that MOVE was bombed um, in, in Philadelphia because there was a Black community that had access to land and had a place where they um, were like, we are going to actually take care of our community in this space. And so um, that, and I think the ability to then have the conversation around what does it, alongside what does it mean to have access to land in the context of the United States and um, um, an indigenous genocide and land removal. So also being able to then be in conversation with groups like the NDN Collective and the campaign that they're about to launch um, this fall with Land Back um i think the ability to really engage with land is um it's critical and important um i think some of the things we need to wrestle with as we move into those conversations are what are the mechanisms for taking land and housing out of the speculative market so i look to models like the community land trust um like the sigorti um uh indigenous led land trust um in the bay area um or the oakland community land trust or even the east bay permanent real estate cooperative um and then what does it mean to actually first have to quite frankly take ownership of land have a deed or title in order to then be able to engage that land in a political project where you're stewarding it in a different way. And so um, sometimes I see people get kind of clunked up, well, if we want to steward it and we don't want to own it, how do how does that work? And, you know, unfortunately, when we see black and brown communities um, experiencing state sanctioned violence, there does need to be a level of security and defense that people can make claim to. And the way that we do that in the United States is having a deed that you can actually take to the courts and defend your right to protect your land. And so I think those are just some of the things that we need, we will be needing to wrestle with um, as we continue to kind of deepen our work around what a regenerative economy looks like. Um, and um, all that to say, though, the, the fact that people are starting to look at land and engage with land as a productive resource rather than something to be extracted from and exploited and speculated, um, I think is part of where the healing comes in, not just around our climate change work, um, but also our interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, Ryan had asked me like, what are some of the projects that you're most excited about? I haven't taken a deep dive on this one yet, but there was a, a community in the South, I want to say in Georgia, from a black community of 19 families that came together and collectively purchased 90 acres of land. And so I think that level of creativity, solidarity, being in community together is, um, is yeah, is super exciting. Awesome. Really appreciate your response to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's top of mind for me. Um, do you have another question that I could throw in there but want to hold space? Or I see Ryan Prod nodding me. <laughs> so I guess maybe this is like in a little okay. bit of a, yeah. a, di a different um, focus. So like, Amak, I feel like a lot of the work that you bring forward around restorative economics is kind of, you know, in contrast to the business as usual mode, right? And there's sort of enterprise models. I think I think the question that I'm kind of wanting to ask is sort of around like, the structure and DNA or whatever of enterprise that is like in alignment with the framework that you bring that's like, um, I know a lot of what I've heard you share is, is about some of these projects, but I guess my question, if I can clean it up a little bit here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it just has to do with like, in terms of different structures or um, even, I guess, you know, practices, culture. Um, I'm particularly curious about structures that are really in alignment with that um, 
framework and what comes up yeah yeah no I'll, uh, I'll try to piecemeal it together um you know one of the things that i try to be really clear and transparent about is um there's a particular set of projects that we look to resource with the restorative economies fund and through the framework um and we focus on projects that um i kind of regard as community wealth building or shared prosperity models and so really quickly those are projects that are um, taking land and housing out of the speculative market um those are projects that are community governed loan funds so in the sphere of c commons the blend Revere funds real people's funds bus new jima project um, also looking at um, market rate, um, equitable economic development projects that are community owned and governed. So this would be kind of the historic Claiborne temples, um, the Restore Oakland projects, um, and then also infrastructure projects. So those projects that are supporting the connectivity of a people in a particular place. So microgrid energy systems, internet infrastructure systems. Um, all that to say, um, I, we have yet, um, we have not really gotten into resourcing particular enterprises. Um, but um, what I look at regardless, um, I always want to ask the questions of how is profit being made and who is accumulating that profit, right? Um, and then the second set of questions are um, how are decisions being made and who are impacted by those decisions? And regardless of whether it's um, an S Corp, a B Corp, a, a cooperative, I think the ability to really have some transparency around um, how any profits are being generated at the expenses that coming out of people's wages and we're not paying people um, uh, a living wage is that because we're not using environmentally um, clean cleaning products, um, but the ability to really visibilize some of those questions so that people can make informed decisions together feels extremely important. And then the other piece is always looking for, um, once again, regardless of how the enterprise is structured, how is this how is this enterprise being rooted in relationship with community and social movements? So how are they kind of leveraging um, their resources, their assets to build power, um, to support um, the, their ongoing community as well? And, you know, an example of this is, um, you know, one of the, back when there was a moment when the Real People's Fund used to be called Democratizing Capital at East Bay, that's when I worked on it. So I'll kind of talk to it in its like previous, previous form. Um, Democratizing Capital at East Bay, we, um, we were building out kind of a movement building strategy. And one of the things we really looked at is what does it look like to uh, to provide non-extractive investments to businesses um, that ensure that their workers not are only able to take time off to go vote, but actually support their workers to be involved and get out the vote activities, right? So being able to kind of volunteer with groups um, like Oakland Rising in the, in the Bay Area or, or Black Futures Lab. What does it look like for um, enterprises once they've kind of generate a certain set of um, profit to be able to reinvest those profits or donate some of those profits to some of their local 501c3 nonprofits? What does it look like for them to actually go and kind of organize themselves to be engaged in city council efforts? And so um, so for me, it's less about the, the actual structure of the business and more around being able to have the discernment to answer those questions around around governance, around financial returns, around being in right relationship with social movements that I think helps to kind of unpack um, how we look to structure our business models going forward. And because at the end of the day, we still want businesses that are financially sustainable, right? We do want them to be able to cover their, their operating support. And um, so, yeah. Thanks, Marcus. Um, <laughs> good question coming in from, uh, from Isabel, uh, who's one of the attendees. Um, she says, what are some of the challenges you face when with educating and introducing others to restorative economics um, for people with different backgrounds? And why do you think that is? And what have you done to overcome those challenges? I'll put it in the chat so you can see the whole thing. Um, and that's a good multi-layered question. Bye, yeah. Andrew. Um, <laughs> I think um, one of the, I get a lot, I get a lot of pushback, I'm not going to lie. Um, and I would say, last, you know, even before um, May 2020, most recently, the language of reparations and really focusing in on race, people found off-putting. Um, and that's because race is a really complex um, conversation to have. 
and people um, don't want to actually have to look at how they may be complicit in a system that disproportionately impacts folks. And so um, all that to say, you know, how, how to bring people They want people to use like along. income inequality, right? That's like more safe. Exactly, exactly. Income. You know, or or we talk about the, the racial wealth divide in a way in which, you know, we're talking just about like income and we're not actually talking about the history and the ways that mm -hmm. particular communities have been denied access to, to building wealth and then losing it. Um, and then not actually wanting to challenge the, the capitalist system. I think it um, can be hard for folks when I say that I do think it's important for us to be anti-capitalist. And I would say that my definition of capitalism is one in which we look at profit maximization at all costs. And I know that sometimes people use conscious capitalism and, you know, I, I I think we could try those terms, but at the same, at, at the end of the day, the drivers behind how we structure those businesses and the focus in on competition and profit maximization always kind of gets us at the same place at the end of the day. So in terms of how to kind of bring people along, it depends on how much time I have, to be honest. Um, but um, I do try to like allow people to sit with um, the history um, of how our country came to be um, and the understanding of um, of how wealth has been created. And I think that there's some great tools out there now with the work of Ibram X. Kendi. I think the 1619 Project does a really great job um, and through both the podcast and the written pieces of unpacking that history. And then there's some great graphics. Um, there's this beautiful graphic called Booms and Busts by United for a Fair Economy. And it shows the ways that um, particular policies have been passed um, as it impacts um, specific racial groups. And you can start to see um, how some policies either created booms for one class, um, one racial class, or was a bust for others. Um, and what that has now meant to having such a deep um, racial wealth divide. So I think those the challenges around really confronting racism and capitalism are hard for folks. Um, I think the ability to stay in the conversation and provide people with tools and resources that they need um, to to do their own work. Um, and the hope is that people do their own work because um, there are times when I have the time and space and capacity to kind of take people through that. And um, I'm also very clear at the end of the day, it's not my responsibility as a black woman to educate people on um, the experience of oppression of black people in the United States. Um, I would say even somebody who's Nigerian American, um, a first generation in the States, have had to study and learn that history that's not a part of my direct ancestral lineage, but just as the virtue of navigating this country in a black skin had to learn it in order to keep myself safe. And so, um, all that to say, I don't, I don't perceive, I don't perceive to water down my work to then make it more palatable for people. I think part of what I get to do is be very clear, um, and stand in my purpose and truth and invite people to be in a place of curiosity to invite people that want to kind of accompany and see how we're moving capital in different ways and the types of projects that we support to engage people that want to be in a true dialogue um, around the analysis and the framework um, and some of our lessons learned. Um, but for people that are looking to kind of point fingers and holes in the work and say that this is not possible and it's not going to work, well, what we have right now is not working. And so we actually need to commit ourselves to trying and experimenting with different tools and systems that are really committed to um, justice and liberation for all. So, yeah. Thank you. You know, I'm curious for your thoughts on, there was an organizer on Michael Moore's podcast who was talking about, a lot of folks are talking about how do we change people's minds, which is great, but we need to change policy. And I'm curious, um what how do you see, how do you view that balance of like everyone's like how, i want to talk to a neighbor and like change their mind versus like policy which is so kind of curious what comes up for you in that conversation and um yeah i mean this is one of those um both and and i think unfortunately we have a, a habit and pattern as a society to go to the either or there can only be one right way and i do think that this is a both and and so i think you know when people are talking about um well we need to talk to our neighbor that's an organizing strategy and we know that organizing works and the ability to engage with our neighbors that may be the neighbor that then actually shows up at the city council meeting that may be the neighbor that casts the vote and turns their family out to vote when we know that city council elections are so tight and so we i don't want to discredit 
um, the importance of the one-to-one -one conversation and the interpersonal organizing that needs to happen. Um, and um, I also want to say that our calls for policy changes and structural shifts um, are also necessary and we can't not do them because one individual says, well, now is not your time. You have to wait at the back of the bus, right? I, I think our ability to understand that both need to happen and there are people who have different skill sets you know, and there's some people that are really great at moving policy and negotiating those amendments and sticking with the policy over the two to five year term that it takes to actually pass the policy. Then there are people that are amazing and skilled organizers. And then there are people that are really good at creating new business models and frameworks. And so rather than saying that there is only one right way to take things on, how do we actually come to understand our are parts of it as one piece of the puzzle and when and how do we bring bring those pieces together? Because at some point, right, the person passing policy is going to want to turn the community out to vote, to to speak on that bill, right? Um, at some point, you know, the business owner is going to want to have all those community members coming to support them. They're going to want to actually have policy that upholds um, a $15 an hour minimum wage. So all of these things um, need to operate um, in concert together um, and not just kind of go solo. Um, and sometimes it can feel like a lot for an individual to hold all of that in their heads. Um, and I think the invitation is to understand what are you good at and how do you be good at what you do and not make somebody else wrong at what they do? Um, yeah. Excellent. And do you, um, and I'm curious if anyone wants to come up We'd love to have any uh, attendees join. Um, so just let me know, Danny, Mikiala, Isabel, <laughs> I'm looking at you. Um, and uh, I guess like- Can I ask you a question? Sure, go for it. Yeah, you know, I think something I'm curious about is, you know, over the course of having done the, the Next Economy MBA and having people kind of come through um, the content that you all provide, and then even the projects that you support, what are you kind of observing as kind of the, some of the stories, examples, the models, the ways to start to shift people's thinking about the work, particularly on the, the finance and um, capital side of it? Oh, man, that's so good. Um, you probably get a different answer from each Lyft partner, so take it for a grain of salt. I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, you spoke about Ibram Kendi and like, I think one piece folks are, you know, me included are beginning to understand is like capitalism does not exist without like racism, like, and, you know, racial capitalism, I think is how Ibram Kendi talks about it. Like, you can't just say like, let's reform the economy without talking about racism. Um, and so one thing that we're sort of trying to look at is like looking at those um, more collectively, intersectionally, however. Um, but it's, so that's one piece is just like talking to people about a bigger piece of the picture as opposed to isolating certain things. I think it's been very helpful. Um, I, I also think that, uh, you know, the, the examples of, because um, often the, you know, you mentioned when the Veer Fund, there's probably like, a thousand people who know about Blue and Revere Fund or something, or, you know, maybe it's more than that, 10,000. But it's like, how do we make things like this, like sort of elevate these types of um, examples? Because I think when people see it's possible, you know, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, which you spoke about, how do we make that a national model um, where it's, you know, owned by the community for the community um, that can't be sold in the speculative real estate market? Um, you know, uh, the new foundation you're launching. We'll have, to, we'll have to get the website and all the links for, for folks. Um, but just, you know, how are even the, from the funders side um, and the foundation side, how are folks thinking about this in a restorative way, as opposed to maybe the old model of, I have the money and I'm interested in this project in your community, I will fund this project. And it's not even what the community wants. Um, so. Yeah, I'd be curious, uh, Andrew or Kevin, if you have you know more thoughts on that. Andrew, you could bring yourself uh, back on screen or 
Maybe you can't. No, nope, you can. It looked like maybe a Mecca, you're about to respond to that. Uh, no? <laughs> Same question. I mean, in terms of that, you know, I think I think we're just I think we are um, similar to how you articulated in general working. We're not necessarily like in a convincing place and trying to work with folks who are um, values aligned, vision aligned enough, um, you know, to be able to engage with that and, you know, definitely not stopping there. But continuing forward, I think we lean pretty heavily on that two loops model. Meg Wheatley and the uh, Deborah Fries and the Burkana Institute created, and um, having some of those conversations in um, yeah. I mean, I think I think the kind of. Uh, we're continuing as as people continue to sign up for the next economy MBA. It seems like there's just more and more discovery, really, more and more kind of exposure. Um, you know, for us, that happens through maybe our podcast and you know, just word of mouth, social media. But um, outside of that organic wave right now, I think that that just is um, a huge obstacle that exists culturally and also. I think continuingly in the, I don't know if that's a word, continuingly, in the, uh, you know, higher education, for example, it's like a massive institution throughout our country that continues to propel this reinforcing feedback loop of a really um, destructive paradigm. And there's not a ton of spaces within that space that sort of offer, you know, for example, the content that we're offering in the next economy MBA. So that if I think being able to elevate into larger, let's economy does great work. And also, I don't know if in the eyes of the mass population, there's like the credibility of a large institution like that. So maybe that itself is problematic, but I see that as um, uh, in one interesting way to explore that more. And maybe we're, Maybe there's more space for that as we're moving into more online education, something that very open to ideas on how to overcome the cultural invisibility of this work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, y'all, for letting me put you on the spot. Um, I actually had one quick follow up question because, so a question that I get a lot is, um, you know, people ask me if, you know, I'll create a curriculum and train them on, like, how to do the work in my consulting practice. And, you know, there's some things that, um, that yes, you know, can put into a slide deck and lecture people on. And one of the things that I sit with is, like, the, the learning is in the doing. It's in the practicing of the work. It's actually being in the technical elements in relationship with social movements and their their community wealth building models that we come to understand what they actually need in order to stand them up and and be successful. And so I'm curious around like, you know, the, in terms of the, the um, MBA program, have you had an opportunity to kind of see and reflect on like how this is creating a robust field of practitioners and, and preparing people then to them be in right relationship with social movements doing the work as well? Cause I'll just send people your way that way. Go ahead, Andrew. I mean, I love that. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess, I don't know, what's the best way to answer that? We could talk about kind of people who have moved on from the program. Um, I mean, one example that I'm just incredibly um, elated about, inspired by, is uh, Olive Watkins of the Black Farmer Fund. And... Um, um, yeah, just, uh, I think I connected with her initially through Leah Penniman from our interview for the podcast and just, um, yeah, Olive has been really crushing it, moving into creating a space within the economic ecosystem that doesn't exist really right now, which is kind of that independent funding for black farm farmers and black land and so on and so forth, which, you know, is intersecting with 
some other things that we talked about earlier in this conversation um, around land. But that's definitely one example that's top of mind for me. Um, and I know that there's others. I don't know if Kevin or Brian, you want to share? I don't want to take up all the space. Yeah. We've got Mickey Alla and Dan, Dan, Daniela, who are MBA students on this. Um, they're both busy. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I think um, one thing that we're trying to do is to create that community more intentionally, because I think it's been like the program and then it's like, you know, some contact with folks, but it's sort of like the seeds have been sown widely. And then it's sort of like, how do you, re-engage and sort of amplify that it's um a thing we're still experimenting with um, yeah i might have said it was a question kind of like how are we supporting that it's just maybe that is part of the question i could speak to yeah, that a little like, bit and um yeah and I, I just want also want to be respectful because uh amaka has another call in four minutes um so it looks like did, did make y'all want to make y'all want to come out sounds like she's going to to jump in to discuss yeah, so I'll have, let me invite Mickey Allo come to come up um, and we'll have to keep it um, Super. brief. Just to, uh, let me see if she got the invite. Well, maybe in the meantime, um, Amaka, do you mind putting the, like any links or like where folks can find more about your work in the chat? Um, that would be awesome. Hey, Michaela. So we only have a couple minutes, I guess. Um, and then Mac has to go. But yeah, if you want to speak to any of those pieces as well, feel free. Well, it's funny because restorative economics is, uh, as I was saying, is as new to folks in this community as even unpacking what neoliberalism neoliberalism is. Um, and so we're starting where the community is by engaging in educational workshops that were actually, um, it's a good reminder to, to take the long view and not be disappointed that we're not further along and having conversations like this one in our community. Um, and I'm jumping back in on the conversation and if I'm, I'm missing something, let me know. But that, the challenge is that people just don't know the terminology. And so restorative economics is, I think even further down the line of the community's understanding than just understanding how we got to this place in our world in the first place, um, if that makes any sense. It's just really, uh, um, it's education, it's learning. And that's where we're at, where we are. And I think that there are a number of people, whether they're working on mutual aid or they're trying to develop new economies for the community, we're trying to harness all of that and tie those threads together partially so people aren't duplicating efforts, are supporting one another. Um, and that's the, that's the work where we are. I mean, we are in a, when we say we're in California, it doesn't feel like California. It feels more like, you know, Trump's backyard, really. So uh, that's what's going on with us here and the work that we're doing. And so I'm really grateful for being able to sit in on conversations like this, to be part of Next Economy. I'm going to probably redo the whole thing because it was so, some of it was new to me. And I just think education, education, education because that part has been left out of our general education. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, Michelle. I appreciate all that. I do want to take like the last minute to just shower yeah. love on Amaka. Thank you so much for joining. Um, yeah. So thanks for, thanks for, for having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Have a great rest of your day and we'll we'll be in touch shortly. I will you too. Thank you everybody. Thanks for having me. I hope it was a helpful conversation. Thank you. Super valuable. Bye. Bye everyone.